it's hard to turn away content that's really good. Yeah. And you kind of gave a hint of content that is not not so good because um, what happens is sometimes people just get this idea in their head of like, oh, yeah, like this is really cool. And you kind of gently want to tell you might want to work on that some more. We've had a few submissions that were just so explicitly Dungeons and Dragons pastiche. And I've actually told a few writers in our rejection letters, look, some of the things that you're using in this story are actually protected product identity things. Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro have outlined saying that you can't use these or we'll sue you. So you, you can't call your your monsters or whatever things that are part of the, the Dungeons & Dragons product identity. Yeah, you can't have beholders flying around. Those are uh, protected. Oh, fucking whoops. I noticed you also mentioned about the references to like HP Lovecraft name dropping, which um, I, I will say I've seen a lot of people say like, hey, my story is Lovecraftian. And I'm just thinking like, okay. <laughs> I, I said that about no. what I'm working on right now. I mean, I love actual Lovecraftian fiction, but so few stories that label themselves Lovecraftian are remotely Lovecraftian. It takes more than just to like a Cthulhu monster, right? I, I think the key to a good Lovecraftian story where it's it's not Lovecraftian mythos, but it has those elements is you've got that constantly creeping dread and kind of a slow spiral into insanity that you as the reader and usually whoever the main character is kind of realize is inevitable throughout the course of the story. Yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is you could say that about all three of our stories that we have for Mark Pellegrini, including the one that's coming up in the, the spring issue next week. Really, it's it's about sort of capturing that that menace, that existential dread, and if Lovecraft, for his mythos stuff, had just wholesale taken Lord Dunsany's Pagana monsters and gods and not changed any of the names, nobody would talk about him today. You know, he'd, he'd just be a forgotten fan writer. But instead, he he took the sort of ideas and themes that Dunsany worked with, and eventually he was able to really make them his own and create his own universe out of it. And, you know, it's if you want to do something cool like that, do it with your own stuff. Don't don't do it with somebody exactly. else's. If you if you have the talent to to write that kind of fiction, write that kind of fiction and make it yours. It's what Lovecraft did. It's almost like the difference if I can think of painting, right? Like if you see a really good painting, you may take some of the concepts from it and then you may say, okay, and like in my style palette or my color palette, like I'll include these but you're not trying to produce a photocopy or a photoshop version of an existing work yeah. if that makes sense yeah i mean if if you follow the concept that like every good story has been told every beautiful painting has already been done you as a creator in this day and age kind of have to adopt themes find techniques pick up strategies and and hone your skill into a frankenstein's monster that hasn't been seen before because the combination that you're putting together is somehow new. Yeah, I mean, think about, you know, cavemen sitting around the campfires telling stories of the mammoth hunts. You know, I mean, they've all been on the mammoth hunts. They all know what's going to happen. It's how well can you tell that story of having hunted and killed the mammoth? But it's like fishing. Every, every single one of those cavemen had a bigger mammoth than the other cavemen. Right, you know, but if you're able to make it exciting and be able to put a little bit of a spin on it or tell it in your own way, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's if it's the same story. It's can you make it your own? 